May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, here I am alone. I have been abandoned. Fathers J.D. and Kelly have fled the coop. <laughs> Just kidding. They're on vacation, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, to preach to you guys. But, uh, and also, Father Greg has very kindly allowed me to pull him out of retirement, uh, helping me today with communion. So you don't have to listen to me the whole time, which is awesome. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the most fitting thing, inadequacy. <laughs> And this is the inadequacy that maybe the third string priest feels. I don't know. Um, but, but really, we're going to talk about weakness today. What is it about weakness, inadequacy, and helplessness that make us so allergic to them? Well, for one, they don't mesh well with our American visions of success, do they? In our high-achieving, professional, business-driven culture, we have to be incredibly competent and confident in our abilities just in order to get a job, don't we? I mean, what makes a successful entrepreneur? Someone who's driven, confident, self-aware, able to take risks, able to adapt, able to communicate well, able to set goals and achieve them. Someone who puts out a quality product all of that's pretty standard, right? Successful people are able to do things well. But there's also a conflict here. When we are uber confident, when we have all of the talent and all of the skill and all the experience we need, who gets all the credit? We do. And you know what uber confident and tal talented people don't need to do? They don't need to pray. They don't need help because they aren't helpless. They truly feel like they are in control, don't they? Now, another reason that we might be allergic to weakness and inadequacy might be because we are afraid of failure. In general, we have a desperate need to look good and be right. And if you ask April, I never look bad. I always look good and I'm always right. But April always does look good, and she always is right. None of us want to look bad or be wrong. Obviously, we all want to look like we have it under control. We say, everything's great. Oh, yeah, it's so nice to see you today. I mean, yes, everything is fine. Thank you for asking. But if we're honest, most of us will confess that we don't feel all that confident. And we will admit that we do feel a little helpless and we do feel weak, we feel overwhelmed. Many of us can just look at our calendars or our bank accounts and we start to panic. And many of us can also just watch a presidential debate and start to hyperventilate. Am I right? It doesn't take very much honest consideration before we realize that we're not actually in control. We can be, we can be caught by surprise at any turn. Markets can crash, hurricanes can destroy, friends can betray, cancers can kill. We need to acknowledge that control is an illusion. We're living on the mercy and grace of the Lord moment by moment. We can't buy control or security. We can't get enough insurance to pay God off. So what do we do? Well, I'm going to suggest that our passages today have some things to show us. First, I think we need to see the truth about weakness. What is it? Second, we need to see the truth about the one whom we serve. Who is he? And third, we need to see the truth of the gospel. How does our Lord help us? So here we go. We're going to start with 2 Corinthians, if you have your leaflets and you want to look. And we're going to see the truth about our weakness. Now, if we are just looking at resume power in the first century, looking at credentials, talent, capability, accomplishments, we would look at Paul and we would find all of those things. He writes this in Philippians 3, which is not in the leaflet. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
In regards to law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, the lawless. Paul was the real deal. He was a Pharisee, meaning he had the entire Old Testament memorized, and maybe I have 1% of it memorized. And how driven and committed was he? He hunted men and women down who followed the way of Jesus and had them thrown in jail and killed. And he wasn't just a Pharisee, he was the son of a Pharisee. He grew up in it. So my dad was a tennis pro, right? I grew up on a tennis court, that's what I say. And I played in college, but I wasn't even good enough to play at Clemson, let alone go pro. Paul played at Hebrew Wimbledon. That's how good he was. The irony, though, is that as soon as Paul met Christ, he realized that everything he had achieved on his own, in his own strength, was rubbish. He says that whatever he thought he was gaining from his pedigree, his talent, his competence, was actually loss. It was actually working against him, and he was in the red. And so Paul's economy of success flips. In 2 Corinthians, we have a new Paul. He begins our passage by telling us about a man who experienced incredible visions that couldn't be described. Paul says that this man was caught up into the third heaven, which is paradise, the place where God dwells with his saints right now. And he says in verse 4 in the leaflet, this man heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Now, I know I have to watch my time, so in short, this man that he's talking about is Paul himself. But he doesn't want to come right out and say it. Why is that? Well, because his values have flipped. He doesn't want recognition. He doesn't want glory. He doesn't see success as a good thing anymore. Paul says in verse 5, On behalf of this man I will boast. But on my, be my own behalf I will not boast except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me, or hears from me. Paul isn't going to seek recognition for his indescribable vision. He's going to boast in his weakness. Now, that can feel a little abstract, right? And if we don't pin down what Paul actually means by his weakness, well, he means two things. First, in the previous chapter, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul gives a list of everything he has been suffering up until that point. And this list is nothing less than insane and incredible. You just need to go home and read it. But it includes multiple beatings with whips and rods, multiple peltings with stones, multiple imprisonments, multiple shipwrecks, and one shipwreck with a night and a day stranded at sea. Hunger, thirst, sleepless nights, and danger everywhere. Kind of like the island on the 4th of July. <laughs> so Paul writes this. If I must boast, I will boast of things that show my weakness. The Jews hate, pa hate Paul. They want him dead because of his preaching. He's become persona non grata. No one from his former life in the Pharisees wants anything to do with him anymore. And they're hunting him down. But even with all of this, Paul's spiritual achievements keep adding up. The risen Lord Jesus has face-to-face -face conversations with him, and he takes a field trip to heaven to learn things he can't even share. So, so to keep me from becoming conceited, Paul says in verse 7, because of the, of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, and see, he slips and tells us it was him all along, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time to trying to identify the thorn because, in short, it doesn't really matter. It could have been any number of things, and Paul doesn't go into specifics on purpose. The point is that it made him weak. It made him dependent, and that is the key word. The thorn made him dependent. And because of his weakness and his dependence, he couldn't look at his incredible list of accomplishments and become conceited because he was still inadequate and insufficient for his work as an apostle without help. 
So did he want the thorn? No, no, of course not. He says three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But the Lord said to me, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardness, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What's, what's the point? The Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. If you were strong, Paul, you would be able to do everything. And you, if you could do everything, you wouldn't need me. And if you didn't need me, you would become conceited. And pride will destroy you in the end. So, Paul, I've allowed you to become weak as a medicine for your soul so that your strength comes from me. This is then how we remember what our weakness really is. Our weakness is filled up in the strength of Christ. When we are weak, then we are strong. When we are dependent, then we are powerful. Our weakness is medicine for our souls. Now let's take a quick look at Ezekiel, and I think we're going to see some very similar themes. Ezekiel was a priest in the time of exile, right? And he lived about 600 years before Jesus was born. And our passage begins in chapter 2 with Zeke on the ground. He's flat on his face. But I want to look at what happened right before this to put him on the floor and make him weak. I'm not going to read everything, but in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has just seen an incredible vision he just saw visions of terrifying hybrid creatures called cherubim and flying, terrifying flying wheels covered with eyes. And those things would have, would have been shocking. <laughs> but that's not what put him on the floor. Above the wheels and the cherubim, he saw a throne. And that's where I'll begin reading the paragraph before ours. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne. In appearance, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him, like the appearance of the bow, that is in the cloud on the day of the rain. That was the appearance of the brightness all around. Then he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. And this is where our passage picks up in chapter two. And he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. So let's summarize. Ezekiel has just seen an incredible vision of unbelievable heavenly beings. And then he sees in his vision something like someone like a burning and shining man who has the appearance of what is like the glory of the Lord. Now, Paul's field trip to heaven was, was a lot like this many years later. They are comparable. Paul says, this man, Paul, heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Both of these men... Could not, could not quite describe what they saw because it was so great and so indescribable. It was so incredible, in fact, that Ezekiel loses all of his strength and he falls on his face. He's overwhelmed and he's weak in the sight of the Lord. He can't hold himself up. So what's our second point? Whom do we serve? It is this Lord the one who, if we were to see him in his flaming glory, would knock us flat on our faces. The one who created heaven and earth. The one in whom we live and move and have our being. He is the one who holds our very breath in his hands. The one whom our words are inadequate to describe. Because he's so indescribable, so great, and so awesome. The same Lord also brought the Apostle John up to heaven also. And in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus again. 
with his glory unveiled as he will appear again on earth with his eyes shining like the sun, a sword coming out of his mouth and his robes dipped in blood. This is the one who gives us his power when we are weak. How does he do this though? This is our third question. How does the Lord help us in our weakness? What is the truth of the gospel for us today? He helps us by his Holy Spirit. For those who are dependent upon him, the Spirit supplies the grace we need. If you look at the next verse in Ezekiel 2, after he falls flat on his face, we see the Lord speaking to Ezekiel. And he says, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke with me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel. You see, Ezekiel didn't have strength to do his work as a prophet. He was weak and helpless. He was completely dependent. And so the Holy Spirit picks him up and sets him on his feet. And what about St. Paul? Did he have strength to do the work that he had to do as an apostle? No. He begged the Lord to remove his weakness, but the Lord told him, No, Paul, my power is made perfect in weakness. Because true strength comes when we don't see a way forward, when we don't know how we are going to do what Jesus asks us to do. That's when we depend on him and trust that he will provide everything we need. Are we concerned about finances, maybe? Do we feel overwhelmed? The question is whether we're living in faith or fear. Does our weakness drive us to our knees? Or do we live in fear and anxiety? Where do we think the best place is to be? It's on our knees. Or are we concerned about our health? Are we overwhelmed with doctors? <laughs> Jesus knows we're overwhelmed. He knows we don't have the strength to handle what he is giving us. You know, when our daughter was sick with brain cancer, some people said, God never gives us more than we can handle. Well, I can tell you that that's really not true. We can't handle anything. When you handle something, you have a grip on it. To handle something is to have the capacity to control it, right? We can't control death. There's nothing to control there. If God never gave us anything more than we could handle, we would be living in our own capacity, in our own strength, wouldn't we? But God doesn't want us to live in our strength. He wants us to be dependent because it is in our strength that never fails. It is his strength that never fails. Our strength runs out. His is never ending. His strength is made perfect, meaning it is displayed and brought to its fullest effect when we are at our weakest. This is the truth of the gospel today. The good news, we don't have the strength. Jesus does. So as I close, this is the question. Whose strength are we working in? Are we dependent on our own pedigree, talent, hard work, or intelligence to get through life? It won't work. What we see is achievement isn't actually helping us. We're actually moving backwards and operating in the red if we're trusting our own abilities. Conceited people in their delusion don't need help. They don't need the Holy Spirit. Conceited people in their delusion don't think they need to change or do anything different than what they have been doing. The problem is, though, that in reality, we're not in control. In reality, we're helpless, and everything could come crashing down at any moment. It's only by the grace and power of God that we are here, standing here, sitting here right now. And someday, 
we will run out of talent and strength, won't we? And we'll, we won't have the capacity to handle what our lives bring because someday our bodies will run down and we will begin to see an end to the road. Maybe it's in 10 years or in 50 years or maybe it's tomorrow. But on that day, when we stand before Christ, all of our works will be tried by fire. And do you know what happens to everything we did by our own strength? It gets burned up like kindling. But do you know what happens to everything that the Spirit of Christ did through us? It becomes eternal joy and reward for us. Pray with me. Dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we hold up our weakness to your strength, our failure to your faithfulness, our sinfulness to your perfection, our loneliness to your compassion, our little pains to your great agony on the cross. We pray that you will cleanse us, strengthen us, guide us, so that in all ways our lives may be lived as you would have them lived, without cowardice and for you alone. Show us how to live in true humility, true contrition, and true love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.